by the US as a way to get the Iraqi government at the time to, to cause a breach of the, of the inspections regime, which would then justify the invasion. It was, it was being publicly revealed afterwards in the documents that we see from the, from the Blair government, but that was a deliberate way in which the uh, British government was backing the inspections in the belief that they would be stopped by the Iraqi government, justifying the military invasion. And you see a similar thing going on with regard to the US tactic of sanctions at the moment in Iran. Now, the Iranian regime, despite its cynical nature, is not stupid. But they're also very resistant to anything that looks like humiliation on the international stage. You see it in the way in which the rhetoric from the Iranian government internationally remains a confrontational one. <coughs> Over the decades, the Iranian government has learned that its interests are only taken seriously on the international stage when it challenges the interests of outside. Now, what I want to emphasize is that this isn't a definite plan. John Bolton and Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, may have their own plans, but they don't control the US foreign policy in the way that, say, Dick Cheney in the George Bush uh, Jr. administration <coughs> did. I'm reminded, though, of a set of documents that I leaked in 2004, um, a set of documents that came from um, um, from um, Downing Street. It became known in the US as the Downing Street Memo, which was from mid 2002, the most well known of which reported the head of MI6, Richard Dealer, telling the Prime Minister that the US government was, uh, the intelligence and the facts was being steered around the policy, the policy being one of regime change. In that context, in those documents I revealed, um, the American and the British governments were deliberately twisting the intelligence they had, deliberately designing claims and claiming certainty about those uh, um, uh, assertions, claiming they were facts when they were suspicions, claiming they were policies when they were one-off incidents. <coughs> and you see something similar going on with Iran at the moment. You see a very straight parallel with where we were in mid-2002 with Iran today. Where my claims have been made about Iran's <coughs> actions, a policy is being built up, a set of allegations are being systematically made about Iran, which don't make sense unless there is an overall objective of regime change in that country. <coughs> and here it's not just the US, but also its key user ally, which is Saudi Arabia. Israel, we mentioned earlier, but here it's Saudi Arabia is far more important. Uh, Saudi government under the erratic influence of Mohammed bin Salman, who is the de facto ruler of Saudi Arabia, who openly compares the Iranian leadership to Hitler and calling for it to be overthrown. That sort of impetuous leadership converges with the impetuous leadership in the US in a way that makes a particularly dangerous emerging. Now, what would be able to restrain this, I think, still? <coughs> is an attempt by the European Union states to form an international consensus around the potential for the JCPOA to be continued, for the, for the parties to that, aside from the US, to uphold their commitments under that agreement. Instead, what we see is a consistently slow process of response. The US withdrew in May 2018, it took over a year for the uh, European Union three to install the system of offsets <coughs> for bartering um, for humanitarian goods with Iran, essentially treating Iran as a charity case 